Hello, this short podcast is designed to show you how to use a spreadsheet to find the infrared active orbitals in a given molecule. So we're going to use the example here of the water molecule pictured over here on the right. So I have my oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms attached. What you have here, we know that that's in the C2V point group. And so we went into the literature. You can find these on the web. You can find these in the back of most textbooks. We have the point group table for the C2V symmetry. So we just put that right into the spreadsheet. What we need to know is that the C2V symmetry has four symmetry elements. It has E, otherwise known as identity. It has the principal axis of C2, and that's in the, the Z direction in this case. We have a sigma, a vertical plane called sigma v in the xz direction, and we have sigma uh, vertical plane sigma in the yz direction. We put a prime in there just to differentiate it from this other one. What's sort of implied there is that there's one of each of these, these symmetry elements. Okay, we don't type a one in there, but there is an implied one right there. And that one there is known is what's known as the, the, the number of elements. Okay, so there's one E, there's one principal axis, there's one vertical plane, and there's one uh, vertical plane in the YZ direction. Okay. All four of those, if I add them up over here, I've I've added those up. I've added one plus one plus one plus one, and that gives me the order of the molecule. So the order of the molecule is H. Okay, so that should be pretty straightforward. Now comes the hard part. What I have to do now is I have to be able to look at this molecule for each of these symmetry elements, identity, the principal axis, the vertical plane, and then the other vertical plane. And I've got to figure out when I do that operation, how many atoms don't get shifted or, or are unshifted. So identity means I don't do anything. So I simply count up the number of atoms in the molecule. In this case, I have three. So the number of unshifted atoms there is just a three. If I look at my principal axis, which again is going in the Z direction, so that if you can see the axis going down through the oxygen, when I do the principal rotation, two of the atoms, the two hydrogens, will move. They'll, they'll rotate 180 degrees. So the only unshifted atom there is the oxygen. So there's one unshifted atom. Likewise, if I look at the vertical plane through the, the XZ direction, uh, the two hydrogens will move, the oxygen will not. So uh, there's a one there. And when I look at the vertical plane in the YZ direction, none of the atoms move. So there's going to be a three there. And it really helps to, to build this model on, on a server or to look at it on the Otterbein site to try to be able to see uh, these things shifting and not shifting. OK, so that's the thinking part of this particular activity. So trying to figure out which atoms are unshifted and which ones actually move when you do an operation, that's the hard part. The contribution is, is relatively straightforward. E is always going to be 3. It doesn't matter how many atoms you have. Okay, E is always going to be 3, and that's straight out of the literature. Sigmas are always going to be a 1. Okay, so those are pretty easy. Uh, coming up with the contribution for the principal axis from the, the mathematics that you were shown in the reading, uh, if you have an even value for the uh, principal axis. In this case, I do. My, my, my n value is 2. That's an even number. I'm going to use a, uh, a formula that's given to you in the book, and that's going to be 1 plus 2 times cosine 360 degrees okay, times pi, and pi is, with the, the brackets there, divided by 180. And the reason you need to do all this times pi divided by 180 is because um, uh, degrees are in, or angles are in radians in a spreadsheet. So that's why you have to do that. And all of that's going to be divided by 2. And that's straight out of the equation that's given to you in the reading. If I coded this in right, I should get a minus 1, and, and I do. Okay, so there's my contributions for each of these symmetry operations. To figure out my gamma here, 
I simply multiply my unshifted by my contribution. Okay, a fairly straightforward calculation. I can just fill that right, and I'm going to center all those to make them look pretty. Okay, so there's uh, my beginning my beginning data. Now what I have to do is I have to figure out the, the direct products for each of these operations. So E, principal axis, vertical plane, and the other vertical plane. And what I have here are, are my, my Mulliken designators. I know that it's A1, A2, B1, and B2 because that's what the point group table is telling me I have. Okay, so to do this, I'm going to do the number of elements in E, which is 1, and I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of the 3 there so that it always comes and gets it from row 3, okay, times the point group value from the table. So I go to E, A1, and I need the C5 there, and again, I'm going to put, um, I'm not going to put a dollar sign in front of anything there because when I fill down, I want that to, to change, times the gamma value here. And I am going to put a dollar sign in front of the 13 because I always want it to come from row 13. Okay, so I'm going to do that. It gives me a 9. I'm going to center that to make it look pretty. Okay, I'm going to come and I'm going to do a fill down here. And then I'm going to come over, grab all that, and do a fill to the right. So once you get one of these equations here, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. At this point, what I want to do is simply do a summation of each of my, my rows of direct product. So I'm just going to do equal sum, and I'm going to do that whole row right there. And I'm going to get a 12. I'm going to do a, come and do a fill down. And there we go. Now, okay, how do you know that's the right answer? Well, one of the ways you know that that's the right answer is all of these things are multiples of my order H. So 12 is a multiple of 4, 4 is a multiple of 4, 8 is a multiple of 4, 12 is a multiple of 4. If you get some numbers here that aren't multiples of your order H, you know you probably did something wrong. And if you did something wrong, most likely a 99.9% .9 chance that you made the mistake right there in, in your unshifted. Okay, now I want to calculate my modes, which are simply going to be that number divided by my order. And I'm going to put dollar sign in front of the I and a dollar sign in front of the three, since that's a constant. Okay, and I'm going to now fill down. Okay. So what this is telling me that I have three A1 orbitals, I've got one A2 orbital, I have two B1 orbitals, and I have three B2 orbitals. Okay. So what my what my total gamma is going to look like. I'm actually going to change windows here. I already typeset this in, so I don't have to do it again. Okay. So what my orbital, my total orbital is going to look like. There we go. Okay. So gamma there is three times a one plus one times a two plus two times b one plus three times b two. So that's my total, what they call my total irreducible representation of this particular molecule. Okay. But what I'm looking for here are my vibrational frequencies. So what I have to do is go up to the table and take away anything that's not a vibration. Well, what can that be? There's three types of energies. There's rotational energy, there's translational energy, and there's vibrational energy. So if I take away rotational and translational, the only thing that's left is going to be vibrational. Well, how do I do that? Okay. To find my rotational, I go up here and I find there's a rotation with the RZ, there's a rotation with the RY, there's a rotation with the XZ. And notice that I have an A2, that's a rotation, I have a B1, that's a rotation, and I have a B2, that's a rotation. So I've, I've coded them in here. Okay. I'm going to do the same thing with translational, okay? Z is a translation, X is a translation, and Y is a translation. So I have an A1, that's a translation. I have a B1, that's a translation. And I have a B2, that's a translation. So I've coded them in here. If I simply do the algebra, 3A minus 1A, 
gives me 2a. Okay, a2 minus a2 gives me no a2s. 2b1 minus b1 minus b1 gives me nothing for b1. 3b2 minus b2 minus b2 gives me a b2. So my total gamma for vibrational should be 2a1 and a b2. Okay, so that what I've just done now is I've predicted I should have two a1 orbitals that are infrared active and I should have one b2 orbital that's IR, IR active. So if I go and I look at my water molecule, I did a, uh, a vibrational frequencies check to see if I get that indeed. And I come down here and sure enough, I have an A1 that's vibrational. Okay, I have a B2 that's vibrational and I have another A1 that's vibrational. So what I've been able to do here, oops, let me go back to my spreadsheet. Okay, I've been able to use point group symmetry to be able to predict what orbitals should be IR active for this particular molecule. Okay, and you're going to be asked to do one for a molecule that is an AX3 type molecule, and BCL3 is a good example. So there's my A right there, and then I have, a, so my boron is A, so this is an AX3 molecule, there's A, there's chlorine, chlorine, chlorine. So the symmetry of that is going to be D3H. And accordingly, you're going to use the D3H point group table. And that is going to be in the spreadsheet uh, for you. So there it is, ready to go and go from there. Okay, hope that helps and good luck with this activity.